Well, I want to say good morning to you all this morning. I don't know if I introduced myself yet. My name is Slim. I'm a pastor here at Mosaic, and so glad you're here this morning. Um, uh, what we are doing is we are, we, are, we are a church that wants to preach the gospel all the time. We actually believe that um, this book that God wrote, it is the, the world's most famous book uh, in, in the history of the world, it's the most talked about, most debated, most translated, uh, most purchased, most stuffed under your bed, all right? It is the most, it is the, is the widest selling, the, the best selling book of all time, and what that book is about is about Jesus. And what we want to do every single week and every single Sunday is talk about Jesus, and so whether we are in Genesis or Revelation, we want to be talking about Jesus, but sometimes it can get confusing, and so we wanted to talk about Jesus very explicitly, and we're going to go through the gospel according to John about Jesus. And so that's where we're at. Now, how many of you guys, as we kick this thing off, like to, to put people in boxes? People don't like to say I like to do that. Some of y'all have said I love doing that. <laughs> it makes life simpler. Uh, but how many of us like to do that? We all do that. Um, I think all of us tend to do that in one way or other. Maybe you've, maybe you've heard about someone. You said, oh, you're an Enneagram 3. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> you're one of those very ambitious people, right? <laughs> and you just boxed them in. You're one of those people, Right? We, we want to do this to people. Um, we, we just naturally do this. We categorize people. I was at a, at a concert a few weeks ago at Common Grounds, and I was standing here with one of you, and we were just looking at all of the different personalities that are on display at a concert. Uh, and so there was this group over here on the right that was just like jumping up and down. We're like, oh, it's amazing! <laughs> and I was just going, oh, those people. <laughs> right? So there was this happening, and I asked the person I was with, I said, you know, if, who were you in college? Which one were you? Uh, just looking a, a, amongst this. And so it wasn't that group. And they're thinking, well, was it the, the guy here who was trying to impress all of the, the opposite sex, working really hard to do that? No. Um, or, or was it the, the, the people in the back that were just too cool for school, judging everybody? <laughs> and he, and I, I think his answer was, I'm none of these. I think I'm like the, the guy who was just awkwardly standing there going like, I hope no one looks at me. I hope no one looks at me. <laughs> we want to put people in these boxes and go, that's who you are. And I think one easy way that we do this when we put people in boxes is we, we divide people into good people and bad people, right? We divide the world into good and bad or good and evil. And we want to think that there are villains in the world and then there are the good people who are here to fight the villains in the world. Uh, there's, there's the outside world, and there's the church, which is set here to fight that world. There's abusers and there's saviors. And I just want to say that today, as we look at our passage, this passage is going to challenge that view of the world. Today, we're going to look at this the title of the sermon is Born Again, and it's this famous phrase that can stir up a lot of different questions, but here's how we're going to look at it. We're going to look at it in three ways. We're going to say, who's this for? Where's it from? And how to get it. So who's this born again phrase for? Where is it from? And how do we get it? So who's it for? Again, as I said, born again is this phrase that just has a lot of baggage in our culture, right? So if you, if you think of someone who's born again, what comes to your mind? I think there's probably three different categories that we put people into, another category when we think of born again, and I think the first time we think of born again, we're like, a born again is person is one who really takes this Christianity seriously. They are emotionally invested in this. They're the ones who are willing to raise their hands in worship. <laughs> and so as you may be in worship, you're like, whoa, they went... They went two hands today. <laughs> they are born again. They, they really believe this. Some of us are like, uh, <laughs> this is all we could get. Or maybe we'll put one up. All right, so uh, born again, we think maybe that emotionally invested person. But another category I think of when we think of born again is that we think of someone who is, who is really, really bad. And then they became really, really good. 
And so you can think of someone who was the, the, the drug addict became missionary, right? <laughs> That's what we think of like, oh, they were born again. They're a completely different person. And so we can think of like the guitarist from Korn, if you knew that story, whatever. Or you can think of my life, right? There's someone who's really, really bad. <laughs> Well, it didn't get to be really, really good. But anyway, so we're, we're, we're working there. Um, so that, that, that's maybe the second person. But the third person I think of when we think of, when we think of born again is I think now it's become, it's this conservative fundamentalist. And so when we think of born again, we're thinking of those who vote a certain way. Um, they have a certain air about them. And then I think maybe the biggest tell is how big their hair is, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so then we think, oh, they're a born-again Christian, and you've, you've now just put them in this category. And what I want us to see is that this text just blows open all of those categories, that this text right here blows up all those preconceived notions of what you think born-again means And it challenges us to wrestle with, are we born again? And so verse 1, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. Now, Nicodemus was a Pharisee, which is like being on varsity as a Christian. Like, whoa, you made it to that level. Well done, well done, right? He's a Pharisee, and Pharisees took the law seriously. They took it more seriously than most take it seriously. They even had 613 extra laws to follow. 613 extra laws to follow than what they've found in the scriptures. But then they also had a fine print behind those laws. And so it got even bigger. And so Pharisees uh, were very serious about everything, but they were very serious about God's law. And sometimes we can go like, oh... You're, you're, you're that type of Pharisee, and we have a negative connotation because the Pharisees get condemned a lot by Jesus, but in that day, the Pharisees were actually really good people, right? They were keeping all of these laws. They were the people that you wanted serving on the school board. They, they were the people you wanted as your next-door neighbor that would loan you, you know, sugar or whatnot. Like, the Pharisees were these really, really good people, but not only were they really, really good, but they were also really, really steeped in Scripture. A Pharisee was required to have the first five books of the Bible memorized. How many of you can even say the first five books of the Bible? <laughs> like, we got Genesis, yada, 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 Revelation, we got it, all right? <laughs> right? We may get to Exodus, and after that, it gets a little tricky, right? So the Pharisees have the first five books of the Bible memorized. And so... Nicodemus was a member of this group, but then later Jesus says, aren't you Israel's teacher? And so not only is Nicodemus a member of this group, he is, he is a leader of this group. He has some clout. So he would be like a celebrity pastor that people follow, people know about. And so this is the setting of what's happening. And then in verse 2, he, Nicodemus, came to Jesus at night. Now think of that setting, the celebrity pastor under the cover of night on a dark and stormy night sneaks into Jesus' house. Why did he come under the cover of night? Because he was scared of losing his status and his realm of what his influence of what he could do it was a huge risk for him to be seen with Jesus and so he comes under the cover of night and, and, and I think on, on one hand, we, we kind of know that feeling, right? Um, he didn't want to lose his status or his place in the social order. And some of us kind of know that feeling. We're scared to speak out on certain issues. But I would say on, in a different way, though, because right here in, in Waco, Texas, we are in the Bible Belt. We are in like the, the, the pinnacle of the Bible Belt. Um, and, and so for us... It's actually beneficial to be a Christian, right? It is beneficial. It's kind of odd when you're not. If you're a student on campus, it's almost as if it's assumed that you are a Christian, which has its advantages and disadvantages. But the problem here in America, and I think in the Bible Belt in specific, happens is when the church has wed herself so much to that status, to just being assumed as being a Christian, 
But then what happens is when those in power start to divert from the Christian ethic, now what do we do? Do we follow those in power or do we actually stand for what we believe is Christian morals and Christian orthodoxy? Like, or, or were we just a part of this Christian group for the status? Were we just along for the ride? Uh, do we follow Christ then? Do we follow Christ when it actually costs us? Like, do we follow Christ when, it, when we can affirm biblical orthodoxy, even if it costs us? Do we follow Christ when we want to affirm social justice, even when it costs us? We want to do, follow Christ in all of these situations. But Nicodemus and many of us come to Jesus under the cover of dark. And so he comes under the cover of dark, he comes to Jesus, and he goes on in verse 2 and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you're doing if God were not with him. This is the end of his sentence, <laughs> and i got to imagine Jesus is going to go, and? <laughs> Notice there's no question in that verse. <laughs> we know that you're, you're a teacher, you could do these amazing signs. Thank you, right? <laughs> it's a question without a question is what, is what he's actually doing there. Nicodemus respectfully calls him rabbi, um, and he says you're a teacher, perform signs, but, but what Nicodemus is saying is that you're, you're kind of peculiar. I don't really understand you, but clearly you can do these miracles, and you seem to know the scriptures well, so you're a teacher. And, and then Jesus does what he just always seems to do in the Gospel of John, which is amazing, is he pulls what I'm going to call the non sequitur savior move, right? So <laughs> the, the gap between verse 2 and verse 3 is just so big. <laughs> For no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. Verse 3. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. <laughs> I just got to imagine, it's like, <laughs> are we speaking in riddles? What is happening here? There's this, this huge chasm between verses 2 and verse 3. And so at one level, I think Nicodemus is going, okay, <laughs> expound on that. But, but on the other, Nicodemus just runs with it, and, and, and he says kind of crassly, which is the the literal interpretation of this passage, and asks, you know, how can a, an adult go back into the womb and be born again? And so he, he kind of has that moment where he's like, Mom, I know this is going to sound crazy, <laughs> but just hear me out. We're going to do a do-over, <laughs> right? So he goes with this crass over-literalization of the statement. But what's, what's more radical is not the, the literal interpretation of the statement. What is more radical is what Jesus is saying behind the statement on the doctrine of salvation, that you have to be born again to be saved, that for anyone to be saved, anyone, you have to be born again. And so when we think of new birth, again, we, we have those categories, but I think a lot of times we think it is for those moral outsiders, that new birth is for the sexually immoral, it's for the drunks, it's for the really scandalous sins. But this passage here, Jesus is telling us that Nicodemus, this upstanding, good neighbor, school board runner, uh, <laughs> he says that you, that you need to be born again. That you and, and, and the really scandalous are spiritually on equal footing. I mean, can you imagine how frustrating that might have been to Nicodemus? Like, do you ever get angry when, when someone works twice as less as you, but maybe makes twice as more as you? Does that bother you? Or maybe in, in, you're... you're you study all night for an exam, and then the person who doesn't study at all just walks in and just does it and gets, a, get, gets an A. And you're going, it, it's, doesn't, it's not fair. <laughs> I worked twice as hard. And do you, do you sense that bitterness rising in you for them? Why is that? Where is that bitterness coming from? What is the point of that bitterness? Similarly, <laughs> Jesus tells us later that pimps and prostitutes get into the kingdom of heaven before the Pharisees. That's Slim's translation. <laughs> Does it anger you to know that Jesus loves those people? 
just as much as he loves you. Just as much. Why? Why why does that anger us? Because we want to contribute to our salvation. We want to be able to say, I did that and they didn't. And they did those things, which I would never do. And it makes us feel better (laughs) that I'm not like them. And so when Jesus says that everyone has to be born again on this equal footing, you've got to imagine that 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 spurred a rise in the Pharisees. They seem so far off. They seem like the evil people, and we're the good people. We want to paint these people into these two categories of, of evil and good, and we want to say, I'm on the good side. They need Jesus. I may, need him in a, I may have needed him a while ago, but now I'm good. There's a great quote by a guy named Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and he says this, If only it were all so simple... If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them, but the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. The line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. Do you believe that's true? All of us are mixed bags of good and evil. There are no purely evil people. There are no purely good people. There are some people who've taken evil and just have run with it, yes. But if you can't acknowledge your own evil, you'll never be born again. Paul says there is none righteous, no, not one. And so until we can acknowledge that we're the problem, we'll never know the solution. Until we can acknowledge that we're the problem, we will never know the solution. So you have to start there. You have to be able to admit that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And so, okay, so everyone needs to be born again, but, but where? Where is this new birth from? Jesus goes on to say that you need to be born of water and spirit. It's this confusing passage uh, that many scholars Many different commentaries debate over what that water and the Spirit is. And so one thought is that the water is the water of baptism, that you need to be baptized, and then you have the Spirit come, uh, which I think there's some, there's some truth to that. There's a cleansing element there that I think we're going to pick up on later. But then there's the other thoughts that you just, it's the water of, ba- it's, it's your, the water of birth. So when your water breaks, and so you've been born once, and now you need to be born again. So there, there's, there's some good arguments for both sides. But then Jesus goes on to say, Flesh gives birth to flesh, spirit to spirit, the wind blows wherever it pleases, and if you're confused by all of that, I think it's okay, because the guy who memorized the first five books of the Bible is confused by it as well. And he says in verse 9, how can this be? (laughs) And Nicodemus asked, and Jesus, showing the patience of the world's greatest small group leader, says, you are Israel's teacher, (laughs) and do you not understand these things? (laughs) Ah. Jesus is just saves his zingers for, for those that should know this, right? Do you not get this? Uh, but, but as the teacher of Israel, Nicodemus should have picked up on all the Old Testament themes that have been portraying, that, the, that Moses and the prophets used to describe this second birth. There's all these different metaphors. Moses told the people that, they needed, uh, that God needed to circumcise their hearts, not just their skin, that they'd have circumcised hearts. And then Ezekiel talks about this water that I think is what John is pulling from, or Jesus is pulling from here. And he talks about this water and a new heart in Ezekiel 36, 25. And it says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Oh, you can just marinate on that Ezekiel 36 passage. He's going to give us, he's going to take our heart of stone. No one wants to think that's us. No, none of us want to, want, want to believe that that's true about us. But then give us a new heart of flesh, of warmth. 
Jesus moves the metaphor to the delivery room, but the message is still the same. Unless the Spirit of God does something supernatural, we will remain spiritually lifeless. Lifeless, like, like a rock, like a heart of stone, that we are cold. And sometimes, we, if we're honest with ourselves, we can see that in our own hearts, that we're cold and we're, we're calloused to people, and we need God to do a miracle to bring us to life, to actually have compassion and kindness towards someone. Now, some of you might say, okay, yeah, but I've, I've met Christians <laughs> who are very cold and callous to people, who don't seem to represent what, what you're saying is what a Christian looks like. And I want to say, bing, that's absolutely right. There are many who go to church who have not been yet converted, who have not actually been born again, and Nicodemus is one of them. In fact, in this Ezekiel passage, one chapter later, there's this famous passage where God takes Ezekiel into this valley of dry bones. And it's, it's horror movie-esque, going into a cemetery. And he tells Ezekiel over this valley of dry bones to just prophesy over them, to preach to a valley of dry bones. And as Ezekiel preaches the bones start to come together (laughs) and they start to click. And (laughs) this is is horror movie, right? This is is zombie-like, that the bones start to come together and then the organs and kidneys and things start coming inside them and then the flesh starts wrapping around the bones as he's preaching and prophesying to the bones. (laughs) And what we are told is that this is the picture of the church. That when we are preaching to God's people, sometimes we are preaching to a valley of dry bones. That we are the walking dead who think we are alive, but we are just walking corpses until the gospel is preached into our bones and we start to come to life. And we go, oh, that's what the gospel means. How do we know that this is true? Have you ever met someone who said, you know, I, was at a, I, I grew up, I grew up in a church that never really preached the gospel. I'm so glad I'm here where we actually preach the gospel. I hope that's the case that happens here. But <laughs> have you ever heard someone say that before? Or you maybe say like, oh yeah, my youth pastor never preached the gospel. And I, I, I said something similar. I, I said, you know, I was at a church and I grew up and, you know, young and I, the church never preached the gospel. But thankfully I'm at a church that does preach the gospel. And I started to like think and ponder on that maybe just a couple years ago and, and, and started to wonder, did they not preach the gospel? Or was it that my heart and my eyes were so closed off that I wasn't able to receive it? Now, you may have come from a church that's been, that was pretty rough, and so I'm not giving them a, a pass, right? <laughs> but I also know that if this is true, that if I was dead before, if I was just a valley of dry bones, that if I had a heart of stone and, and the gospel was preached and, and the spirit didn't move in me, there's a reason. <laughs> Try preaching to a rock and see if it becomes a heart. Like it doesn't, doesn't usually work that way, but sometimes it does. <laughs> sometimes it does that, that God actually changes our hearts and brings us to life. And so where does this new birth come from? Jesus answers with this random story. It feels kind of out of left field. Where does this new birth come from? He goes to the book of Numbers, where the people of God were bitten by these poisonous snakes. And in this moment, the people of God are being bitten by these poisonous snakes. They are on the ground. They are dying. The venom is in them. There is not much they can do. And so what does God do? He tells Moses to get a bronze snake and put it on a pole and if you look at that bronze snake, you will be healed. Which is kind of a random story in the book of the Bible. You're going, don't know what's happening there. <laughs> and I'm guessing many didn't know what was happening there. But Jesus now takes that story, that analogy, and it refers it to himself. Like the people are bitten by snakes. The poison is in them. And without divine intervention, they will die. The snakes in the camp are from the Lord. He sends them on account of their rebellion and their grumbling. So God sent the snakes. He sent the curse on them. But then 
the means that God uses to rescue the people, he puts that same curse up on a pole. And so all they have to do is to lurk, to look at that curse on a pole. All they have to do to be saved is to look at the provision that God gave them on a pole. And so in verse 14 of our passage here today, Jesus says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And it's not just eternal life as in quantity, it's quality, that they will have eternal life. Life. They will have life to its fullest. And as wild as it might sound, that Jesus is now in the place of the snake as the source of healing, as the source of rescue, but also Jesus is in the place of the snake where the snake is, is, is representative of the curse. The curse is up on the pole. And this is what is so shocking the snake is evil. The snakes were killing people. The snake on the pole is a picture of the curse of the curse, that God was executing that curse. And so it was with Jesus. When Jesus is hung on the cross, we're told that Jesus becomes the curse for us, that Jesus becomes our sin, and that when we look on that curse, that cursed one, we get saved. That when we look at Jesus, he takes all the venom and all the poison of sin into himself. And when he dies on the cross, he lets us free. And all we have to do is look. I think it is sheer lunacy to think that we can earn our own salvation. That we say, I'll do what Jesus just did right there. I'll take all the venom of that poison of that sin. I'll earn my way out of this. There's a great line from a band that I like called Arcade Fire. It says, but do you think your righteousness can pay the interest on your debt? I have my doubts about it. (laughs) Sometimes I do think my righteousness, my goodness can outweigh my evil deeds that my, my titles, my degrees, all of the works that we want to do, we think that'll, that'll excuse us from a need of a Savior. And we're told that those things are filthy rags, that every single one of us needs to be born again. Nicodemus needs to be born again, and you and I need to be born again. We need the Savior of the world to be a curse, and that will reach us. And so, no, we don't need a teacher or a rabbi, we need a savior. But here's the good news, and and I want you to hear me. If you miss anything else in the sermon, but you get this, I hope you get this. Listen to this. No matter how good you are, you need a savior. But no matter how messed up you are, you can be saved. No matter how good you are, you need to be born again, but no matter how messed up you are, you can be born again. There is no, there's nothing that's going to stop you from being born again because we all equally need that salvation. We all can equally look to that cross. And so my question that I've been building up to this morning is, have you been born again? Have you been born again? Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Doesn't just, <laughs> you're going to church doesn't make you a Christian more than going to a bank makes you a millionaire, right? Like it doesn't, doesn't work that way. I, I'm not asking you if you believe in God because even demons believe in God, and even demons have a respect for God. I'm asking you, have you been born again? And if you're saying, I don't know, but I want to, how? How can I be born again? And that's the final question to hear, how to get it. And over the years, I've heard people, um, over the years, I've heard people tell me in, in certain circles, man, I've, I've got the bug. And do you know what they mean when they say, I've got the bug? When they're around all these babies, and they get the bug, and maybe it's parents who have already had kids, and they're going, ah, I got the itch, I got the bug, I kind of want another baby. There's this, there's this desire. I hear from parents who are saying, I want to get pregnant again. I want to get pregnant again. But you know what I've never heard? I've never heard a baby say, man, I really wish my parents would conceive me. <laughs> it doesn't happen. <laughs> I've never heard a baby say, I really hope my parents 
move along with things, right? That doesn't happen that way. That's not going to happen. What we are saying here is that these things don't just happen. How does a dead person come to life? Is it hard work? You just tell a dead person, come to life. Absolutely not. Can you, tell, can you tell a, have, a, have a baby just beg parents to, to, to make them? No, it doesn't work that way. I think a similar way to think about it is this. Have, you know your taste buds change like every seven years or so like that? How many of you coming out of the womb loved kale? Any? Liars. <laughs> Some of y'all, there we all, maybe the Lord blessed you. But most of us coming out of the womb, we don't love kale. It takes a miracle of the Lord to love kale. And some of that, the Lord has worked a miracle in you. He's still working on me. <laughs> but none of us can go, Lord, I just really want to change my taste buds, and so I'm going to do it. I'm going to start working to make my taste buds change. You can't do that. You can't force yourself to start liking different things. The Lord has to do these things for you. The same is true about being born again. And so, like, how can we get it? What can we do? Technically, there is nothing you can do to be born again. It has to happen to you. God has to intervene for you. It's why he says else here that the wind blows wherever it goes, meaning that you don't really know how this is going to work. We don't understand how the wind blows. Meteorologists are wrong quite a bit. We don't understand the wind. We don't understand how God works, but he works. He gives people new eyes and new hearts and new ears. But again, how? How do I get saved? How do I get born again? And yes, we want to affirm God's work and sovereignty in this. But also, when Jesus comes out of the wilderness, the first thing he says is repent and believe and be baptized. Like he comes out and he says, you want to be saved? Here's what it is. It's repent and believe. And I think when we think of the word repent, That also has a lot of connotations, a lot of baggage with it. And yes, it means to turn away from something. It means to to quit with that sin and turning away from it. But I think what we miss out when we think of the word repent is that we're missing out on what you're turning away from and what you're turning to. That when you repent, you are now turning to be in the face of our Lord and Savior. That repentance isn't just stopping something. Have you ever try to just quit cold turkey on whatever that sin is for you, it becomes very difficult. But it's, it's, it's repenting from that and getting in the face of the Lord is where the magic happens. It's where God works. It's like if you were in a relationship and you're in a conflict and maybe you were contributing to that conflict and you said, okay, I'm just going to stop doing the X, Y, and Z. I'm just going to stop talking bad about them, whatever it may be. Okay, that's part of it. But now to to restore the relationship, you go face to face with the person. And so repentance is not just stopping something, it is restoring a relationship. If we think back to that snake analogy, the venom that that, that represents sin, the venom that that is in the body, that is killing the people, our sin is in our soul, it's killing our soul. And Moses was told to put the bronze serpent on the pole, and all they had to do was to look. And so yes, it's 100% God's work. But still, God tells you to look. He still tells you to look at Jesus on the cross, which is an act of repentance. And in that day, some were so sick, they couldn't, he didn't say, come and crawl and touch the pole. He just says, look at the pole. There's the story of Charles Spurgeon's conversion how he became a Christian. Before he, Spurgeon was, is, was this great preacher. Um, he became a Christian when he was a teenager. And when he was a teenager, there was this, he was wanting to go to church and he was, he was on his way out to church, but there was this massive snowstorm that hits his town. And so he was wanting to go to his church, but the massive snowstorm was, was beating down so hard that he had to turn down an alley and, and came into this small little Methodist church. And the storm was so bad that there was only like a dozen people in the church at the time. And apparently the snowstorm was so bad that even the pastor, the preacher, couldn't make it to church that morning to preach the sermon. And so they had a shoe salesman or a shoemaker uh, come up and preach that week. So, sermon, so Spurgeon is in, this, is in this church, and the shoemaker's text for his sermon is Isaiah 45, 22. And he says, look 
unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. And that shoemaker says, you just have to look. You don't have to lift a finger. You don't have to be able to earn a thousand pounds a year. You just have to look. Anyone can look. Look look to me. We in the world want to look anywhere but Christ. We want to look at our jobs or our relationships or look at sex or anything but Christ. And Christ is sweating on the cross, died, buried, and he says, look to me, is what the preacher told him. And then Spurgeon says, and then the preacher looks directly at him. Remember, there's only a dozen people in the church. And says, young man, you look very miserable. And Spurgeon says, I had not been accustomed to having remarks made from the pulpit on my personal appearance before. (laughs) And he says, however, it was a good blow. It struck right home. And he continued, and you will, the pastor, pastor continued, and you will always be miserable. Miserable in this life and miserable in death if you don't obey my text. But if you obey now, at this moment, you will be saved. He said at that moment, he was ready to do anything for him. He said, I was ready to to do 50 things to, to, to get this salvation. And suddenly he realized all he had to do was just look. And repentance is just turning and looking to Jesus. That's all it is. To look on him and be saved. That's all it is, but it's all it is. It's impossible for us. It's so simple, but so impossible without the Lord breathing life into you. And so I'm begging you to listen to the Lord's call this morning. Look to him. Look to the cross and be saved. To be born again. Maybe you've never been born again. Look to him and be saved. Put your trust in him. And that's where we go repent, but also believe. And believe is not just mere affirmation. It is putting your hope in him. So when rock climbers are are repelling down a mountain, they put their hope in these anchors that are keeping them locked into this mountain. That's what it is to put your hope into something, is to put your full weight into it. And so repent, but then believe. Put your full weight and hope into Jesus. Lean into that anchor. Lean into the anchor that is this text. This is a beautiful text, and it's an anchor for you and for your life. But let me end with this. This is this passage here that that is building up to John 3.16, which is the world's most famous passage. There's a reason it gets memorized. John 3.16 is a a meditation on what we just talked about. It is a summary of this beautiful, what does it mean to be saved? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. If you haven't memorized, I encourage you to memorize. There's a reason people memorize this. There's a reason people put their hope and anchor in it. But I think we get this verse wrong a lot. Most of us believe that God loves us because Christ died for us. Are you tracking that we, we are loved because Christ died for us. That it, it took the death of Christ for God's view of us to move from wrath to love. Because before, the only way God saw us was an object of wrath, ready to be cast away. And, and I can promise you that if you believe that to be the way that God sees you and me, that we will always doubt Christ's love for you and me. That we will always, always, always doubt his love for you and me. Because if we believe that God's deepest heart towards you is wrath and not love, that the reason he has to love you is because it killed his son, then he's only going to be reluctantly loving you. That I have to love you. But that's not what the text says, is it? No, the text says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only one and only son. And so love is not the consequence of the incarnation. It's the reason for the incarnation. 
Oh, that's so good. That, that love is not the consequence of the incarnation. It's the reason for the incarnation. It's the love of God that motivated him to send his one and only son. It was love that Jesus came into the world, not to judge it, but to save it. And so God's deepest heart towards you and me, towards Nicodemus, towards anyone else, is not condemnation, but it is love. He expounds on that in verses 17 and forward, that God loves the cosmos in this way, the world, the cosmos, all things, all people without qualification, no matter who you are. He, his deepest way to relate to you is with love. So no matter who you are, what you, you've been through, what your life has been like, whether you identify more like the prostitutes or whether you identify more like Nicodemus, his deepest affection towards you is love. Later in this book, Nicodemus does something that gives us a little hints that maybe God did a miracle in his heart. Nicodemus asks for the body of Christ after he was dead, dead to dress him, which and his position could have just caused a huge uproar, a huge stir. So at great social cost, now it's not proof that, that Nicodemus was converted, but it's something it's something. And so I just want to say, no matter who you are, whether you're upstanding citizen or social outcast, you need to be born again. But no matter who you are, you can be born again. You can. And so I just say, anchor your life in his love. Anchor your life in this verse and the love of Christ and turn your hearts to him and go before his face and be born again. Let's pray.